Well, this year we're walking through these different names for God. And can I say, I really hope that what's not happening this year is you're, you're going, oh, yeah, that's another name for God, and that's it. That you're, that you're understanding that God's name is his character. God's name reflects his being. God's name reflects how he relates to you. So when you say, God, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, you're talking about the scope and the grandeur of God. And you say, God, you're the great I am. You're the I am who's with me now, but you're over all things. And each name has meaning. And, and this name that God is our shepherd is a powerful one. Sherry and I uh, like to take uh, hikes in the Fort Ord Hills. And certain times of the year, uh, have anybody, anybody seen the flocks of sheep and goats up there? All right, it's, it's amazing. And sometimes when you walk, they'll be coming across the the, the trade. One time where we kind of were walking and the shepherd just said, keep walking. So they would kind of part and we had sheep and goats all around us. And, but anytime we go on the hills and we see a flock of sheep or the, the goats, we see them there. We always, we always do this. We look and we try to find the shepherd. Because if you can see the sheep, you can always find the shepherd. That's a good message for our lives. Whatever's going on, if you're a sheep of his pasture, he's always there. Sometimes the shepherd's right there near him. Sometimes the shepherd's like way off on it. We look at oh, he's oh, way over there. And it's kind of like we sort of play this game, find the shepherd game, where we can like, oh, there he is. But he's always there. He's always there. And so we're talking tonight about his name is Shepherd. And, and, I, and I love that picture. We're going to look at a passage in Genesis 48 that I have never preached on before. And I'm going to preach on this, and also we're going to look at Psalm 23. But this passage in Genesis 48, I, I just, it's never been an occasion where I focused on it in a way that it kind of rose to the surface of being a passage to preach on, but it's a powerful passage. In Genesis 48, and I'll give you kind of the setting, I'll give you a little bit, little bit of the history of, of God's people. So I'm going to move this over here. So the patriarchs, or, or the, the fathers of the faith, of, of the ancient Jewish faith, were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when we get to chapter 48 of Genesis, we're looking at Jacob, but he's, Jacob's very, very old. And what we see Jacob doing is Jacob is, is here where he is in his life, Jacob who's also called Israel. So sometimes he's called Jacob, sometimes he's called Israel. So here he is, and he's, he's reflecting on his life, he's very old, and he's praying and blessing the next generations, but he's looking back to the previous generations. So in this passage, you're going to see him talk about Abraham and Isaac, his grandfather and his father. But also he's talking to Joseph, his son, his son that he thought was dead for years and years and years, and was finally reunited with him. But he's blessing Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So you have five generations in this one passage. So I want you to notice that. And I also want you to notice something in chapter 48, in verse 2. It says, when Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you. So Jacob, he says, Israel, or Jacob, rallied his strength and sat up in his bed. He was so old. He was so frail, so fatigued. He had to take all of his strength just to sit up. You got the picture? He's near the end of his life. All right? And then you continue on. You look down to verse 9. Uh, you know, he, he, says, he says to Joseph, Israel says to Joseph, his son, bring them to me so that I may bless them. Bring me your two sons. Bring me Ephraim and Manasseh. And I love this. Verse 10 says this. Now Jacob, or Israel's eyes, were failing because of old age, and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. You see this old, old man. The third generation of the faith, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And now he's got his son Joseph with him, his son who he, he thought was dead, his son who he never thought he'd ever see again. But not only has he seen his son, he's seen his son's sons. And, and so he's getting ready to speak a blessing on them. He actually says in verse 11, Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again. And now God has allowed me to see your children too. Can you hear the heart right there of a grandfather, right? So verse 15, we read this. So then he blessed Joseph and said, and here's what I want you to notice. As, as, as Jacob blesses his son Joseph and then blesses his children, remembering his grandfather and his father, two generations before, two generations after. We're in a culture now that we don't think generationally. The ancient world, everything was about the generations. We should be more like that. We're so about now in this moment, we forget what's happened before, and we certainly don't think enough about what's coming next and how we're preparing for the coming generations. But I want you to notice, because in this prayer, Jacob could have said, he could have referred to God with any name for God. He could have referred to him as the, as, as the Alpha and the Omega, as the great creator. There were all kinds of names he could have used. 
But I want you to notice the name he uses for God as he remembers God's faithfulness to Abraham and Isaac, to his grandfather and father, and as he prays for God's faithfulness to his son Joseph and the generations to come, Ephraim and Manasseh, all right? Listen to this in verse 15. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, he points back, before whom Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, listen to this, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. That's the name he uses. May the God who has been my shepherd all my life, every day. Think about your worst days. I'm looking, some of you I know and some of you some of your hard days have been. Um, I, think, I think, you know, the God who has been my she- shepherd the hardest days of my life. And he says, I know you're at a church 10 years, 11 years, and you know enough people's stories. That you can't look around and see faces and not remember their stories. May the God before whom my father, fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, all of my life, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, to the next generation. May he be their shepherd as well. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Do you see the generations? Do you see the beauty of this? So here Jacob is, and he's praying for the coming generations, but he's remembering the past generations. And so as he looks back, he remembers Abraham and Isaac. Now, if you know the book of Genesis, Abraham and Isaac understood that God was their shepherd with them every day of their life. But if you know the story of Abraham or the story of Isaac, was their life easy every day that they walked on this earth? No. They had their own struggles, their own pains, their own losses. Was Jacob's life an easy life that had just gone smoothly? No. But Jacob says, God, you've been my shepherd from all my life to this very day. You've been with me. So you know what Jacob is saying? He's saying, when my brother hated me enough to threaten my life and chase me from my homeland. God was my shepherd. All the days till today. When my beloved son was killed by a wild animal and his brothers brought his cloak home covered in blood and I, and I buried my hopes and my heart with him. God was still my shepherd. He didn't know that Joseph was still alive. He thought he was dead. But he says, even on that day, and for all the years till I saw him again, God was my shepherd. When he ran from, for his life from an angry father-in-law, from Laban, who was threatening his life. I mean, he, was, he just seemed like he was always being chased by somebody who wanted to kill him, right? He said, but even then, God was my shepherd. When he wrestled with God, and God popped his hip out of joint, and he, and he limped away in pain, he could say, for all the days of my life to this day, and implied for all the days to come. He is my shepherd. When he had to leave the promised land because of a famine and come to a foreign land, to Egypt, he said, he's still my shepherd. Do you get the picture? When you pray, oh God, my shepherd, you know that wherever you are in the pasture, sometimes God's really close right next to you and and just like the shepherd in the hills in the Port Ord Hills, but sometimes he's up on a hill kind of over there watching And you go, God, you don't seem very close right now. But when you're a shepherd of his flock, you know, my shepherd's always been watching over me. Whatever I've gone through, whatever I've experienced, God, who is my shepherd, is with me. So let me ask you a question. Do you live with a deep sense that God is your shepherd and has been all of your days until this day? Some of you, that's not as many days as others. I loved just, uh, and, and I'll tell you more about, I, I had a thing on my skin. I, I, I'm going to tell you about my, a little bit of my journey uh, with my skin here. But I, Sharon had to move over there and get out of the sun because I had a treatment just recently and I'm not supposed to be in direct sunlight. And so until tomorrow, then I'll be fine tomorrow. But I'm trying to, follow, trying to follow the rules. But so I was standing over here and I was looking over this way. I was just going to say, I could see some of the younger women in our, in our church. When I say younger women, I'm not talking about the women in their 20s. I'm talking about the women in their teens and younger. As I look from here across, it's like, you... I saw a couple of young women back over there who were dancing while we were singing and playing air guitar, right, and just getting into worship a little bit. And I just stood there thinking, all the days of their lives, God's their shepherd. They don't know it yet sometimes. Some days they know it, some days they don't. 
And then I looked around the courtyard and I saw some people that had been walking on this earth five, six, seven times longer than those young girls have been. I think most of them would say, all the days of my life. Sometimes he's a shepherd that I can feel right next to me. Sometimes he's a shepherd where maybe he's further up on the hill. He's still watching, but he feels far away. But can you say that God has been my shepherd all the days of my life until today? Uh, my, my, uh, one of my journeys in my life has been dealing with skin cancer. Now, by God's grace, I'm going to be very clear because rumors get started very quickly and travel quickly and they aren't accurate. I don't have melanoma. I've never had melanoma. I don't have skin cancer that will kill me. I have something called basal cell and a, and a little bit of squamous cell. And those are things that will just kind of eat away at your skin. And it came because I spent my days on the beach for about three months every year. I grew up in Huntington Beach and my mom was a redhead. So my mom gave me many great gifts, but pigmentation was not one of them. And so I burned very, very easily. So I burned and burned and burned every summer. And about 30 years ago, I had to go to a doctor, and they said, oh, you have skin cancer. And I said, oh, am I going to die? And he said, no, no, it's just, we just got to cut it out. And so I've had 13 surgeries now to cut skin cancer, and 12 of them about on my face. One time after I had one out of my face, I prayed, Lord, could the next one just be somewhere besides on my face? But the problem is when you're in the water at the beach, you get the burn of the sun, and you get the reflection off the water, and your face just gets crisp. And that's what happened. And I, but then the, I prayed about it, and the next time, I had a surgery on my shoulder. And then the next time, and last year, I had three surgeries on my face, where they had to cut chunks of my face out. My doctors have always said, I love you, I love working with you, but we're just going to take you one piece at a time. And so uh, that's, that's part of it. So, so Monday, my, my doctor said, you got to do this thing uh, where we either do, they give three different options, where they put stuff on your face and try to do all, kill all the precancerous cells. I said, what's the, one, what's the one you can give me where you, you can do it on Monday and I can preach on Wednesday night and preach the next Sunday? <laughs> because I said, I'm in front of people all the time. So, they, so if I look a little pink to you, if you're far in the back, you don't probably even notice, but if it looks like I fell asleep under a sun lamp and burned my skin, the doctors did this on purpose. And within about three or four days, I'll be looking wonderful. I feel fine. But here's the thing. Each time, and last year when they did the three surgeries, I said, can you just take one day and just do the forehead and the nose and the ear. I think it was that, those are the last three. Yeah. And they said, could you just do them all in one day and let me be down for a week? They said, no, we have to do it. Uh, do it, and then three weeks later, we'll come back and do another one. And so uh, that's, but can I, can I tell you, so even with that, every one, every one of those days, I thank the Lord that he's been my shepherd. I thank the Lord that I have doctors that could find this stuff and deal with it and take a chunk from a skin behind my ear and sew it on my nose. I can show you. If you want to see pictures, some of you, I think, look really interested in some of the kids. I can show you pictures. They're really cool. I, I like pictures of that kind of stuff. But anyways, that's not part of the sermon. The, the point is, whatever your journey is, Jacob's journey was one of tremendous pain and loss and tremendous victory in the presence of God. But he says, through it all, through all of it, the Lord has been my shepherd. And so turn with me to Psalm 23. And I just want to get just kind of get a sense that when we say the Lord is my shepherd, what do we mean? If you say, okay, God is my shepherd. He has been my shepherd all the days of my life. He will be my shepherd for all the days of my life to come. What are we talking about? And so I invite you just to listen to these words. Some of you have memorized this psalm. Some of you have it open in front of the Bible. Some of you are just going to listen to it right now. At home, we'll have it up on the screen for you there. But just listen to these words. So when you pray, Lord, you are my shepherd, what is it you're declaring? When you pray to God as your shepherd, what is it you're expecting? This psalm kind of lays out what this means to understand that God is our shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. That's what your good shepherd does. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Listen to that. Even though I walk through the darkest valley. Is, is my shepherd with me? Is he still here? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Some of you right now, some of you are in dark valleys. The people sitting six feet away from you may not know it. But the people sitting one foot away from you probably do. Right? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. In the ancient world, that was a picture of just lavish goodness. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. That translates into any culture, any time, doesn't it? My cup overflows. God's provision, God's goodness. Surely goodness and love will follow me. And this goes right back to what Jacob said in his blessing. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. By the way, David who wrote this, he had some days he had to remember God was his shepherd. He had some hard days, some tough battles. Sometimes he made some bad choices. Had to come back to God and repent. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All the days of my life and forever. What do we mean when we say, God is my shepherd? What does it mean when you pray to the one who is your shepherd? And so just, just think about some of these things. It means that God provides. He provides. We can declare, I lack nothing. Now, let me be clear. This isn't a promise of opulent wealth. That's not what this is. Does God at times bless at that level where he gives you lots of stuff? Sure, sometimes God does that. But not, not for everyone, not all the time. But he provides what we need, our daily bread. And we have to keep that in mind because sometimes we forget what we really need. And we think that God's not giving us enough because we want what they have. But we say, Lord, I need what you need for me. I need what you provide for me. And there's great power and contentment. But to say, I lack nothing. The essentials of life, God gives them to me. He refreshes. The sense that when you say, God is my shepherd, God, my shepherd, refreshes me. What does that mean? Green pastures, quiet waters. Do you get the picture? I mean, beautiful green pastures, quiet waters. This, you know, this, this courtyard, I think during this COVID time, has become one of those places. Like, like a, little, a little sanctuary, a little place where in the midst of all the craziness, we continue to gather as God's people and worship Jesus. But he creates those places, those opportunities, those moments to refresh our soul. He guides us, verse 3, in right paths for his name's sake. What does that mean? It means God guides us for his glory. God doesn't always guide us where we think we want to go. Because listen, if God always guided us where we thought he should send us, listen closely, he's no longer guiding us. It's us. <laughs> so, you know, God, you have to guide me exactly where I think I should go. Then you're not asking God to guide you. You're trying to coerce God. But when you say he guides me, that means I, I, just, I seek where he wants me to go. I follow where he wants me to go. I humbly submit to him. God is more than a GPS. He gives right paths. He just doesn't try to get from point A to point B. A GPS can do that for you, and I'm thankful for a phone that you can do a little search and find your way where you're going. That's great. But God guides you on the right paths. It's not just getting you to the right place. It's getting you to become the right person, to have the right experiences, and to walk with the shepherd every step of the way. See, God's path is the right path because on that path, we walk next to him every step of the way. Can we wander and go off the path and walk away from God? Yes. And what happens then is God doesn't leave us, but maybe we might be over here and he's over here and we keep wandering. He's a shepherd still watching, but there's times where we walk so far from his path that he's watching over us and there may be times he even chooses to protect us. There may be times he chooses to not protect us so we can count the cost and turn back to him. You know, sometimes one of the greatest gifts God gives you is letting you get in trouble, letting us get caught, letting us stumble a little bit so we come running back to him. But he guides us in the right paths, not just where we're going, but with him the right way. In verse 4, he gives us confidence. No fear in the dark valleys. And I don't think that no fear means everything's fine and light. But it means ultimately, ultimately, I know I'm not alone. And can I tell you, as a pastor, I often, I often describe one of the things about being a pastor, one of the unique things about being a pastor, is when you're a pastor, you get to be very close to people in the best, most wonderful moments of life. When I do a wedding, I get to stare, I get to like stare at, I'm going to talk to a couple I know, I've got Terry Betts here, okay, I get to stand about, they're like right here, and I get to watch it, I mean, when I do a wedding, I got the best seat in the house, right? In the greatest moments of life, this, this last weekend, 20, 39, 
39 people became Christians. 39. 39 people here at Shoreline gave their hearts to Jesus this weekend. Yeah, so praise God, right? I'm humbled that I got to be a little part of that and up close to that, that thing. But I also, as a pastor, I get to stand really close to people in the most painful, difficult, heart-wrenching moments of life. When a marriage blows apart and you sit with a couple and try to help them salvage what's going on there. When a life ends and family has to say goodbye to someone who they thought they would have to say goodbye to now or maybe for a long, long time. As a pastor, you, you, you're up close with the most joyful, wonderful moments and the most painful, heart-aching moments. But, but to understand that, that whatever you walk through, whatever the valley, whatever it is, we're not consumed by fear or ruled by fear because we walk with a good shepherd side by side. He protects. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod was a, was a weapon for a shepherd, for protection. The, the, the shepherd also had a sling and stones. The shepherd had a number of different weapons. But a shepherd protected the sheep, and God protects us. I really believe, I've, I've had this thought so many times through my life as a Christian. I think of one day when I see Jesus face to face, and when, I, when I'm in glory with him, I want to say, Jesus, will you show me all the times you protected me that I didn't know it? All the times I was heading for a cliff emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually, physically, that you sent your angels, that you, inter that you intervened for me. I think God will say, we're gonna, it's not going to take eternity, but it's going to be a lot of time for me to show you all the times you were on the edge of getting in trouble, and I stepped in to protect you. But there's even moments where you kind of recognize it. Do we recognize his protection? He disciplines us. The staff of the shepherd was a tool of discipline, a tool of correction for the sheep to teach them to not go there, to not do that, because that's dangerous. And a shepherd would discipline and, and train and equip the sheep to make better choices, to not put themselves in danger. That's what our shepherd does. He lavishes us. A table, oil, and a cup. There's three pictures. You set a table before me before my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Remember in the ancient world, how do you make a point? You say it over again and over again and over again. Three pictures saying the same thing. God is lavish. God is generous. Do you understand that the good shepherd has been so generous to you? Sometimes we spend so much time focusing on what we haven't gotten that we stop looking at all the things he's poured out on us. He lavishes us. He pursues us with goodness and love. He pursues us. He pursues us. When I think of this, I think of, uh, of my son Josh and his wife Taylor. And Josh and Tay have a wolf pack. They have four dogs. And the people online at home, you'll get a chance to see a picture of them with their four dogs if you're at home right now. If you go up and watch the service later, you can see my son and his wife and their four dogs. But I love, I love when they're around with their dogs because their dogs, I, I look at this picture of, of, you know, he pursues, surely goodness and love will follow me. I watch Josh and Tay's four dogs. And they, they go where Josh and Tay go. They come to visit our home. Our home is, you know, it's not their home. It's not their neighborhood. But the dogs can kind of run wild. And they, the dog can even go out around the house. And they're not worried because they stay close to Josh and Tay. They're, they're on their heels. And if Josh gets up and says, and we, we were just together on Easter Sunday, Sunday and he said, I'm going to go run around the house. He started running. And what happens? The dogs pop up. Boom. There they go. On his heels. Right? Do you understand that goodness and love from your good shepherd are on your heels. Where you go, they go. What a picture, right? Surely goodness and mercy or love, steadfast love, will follow me all the days of my life. And then finally in verse six, he saves. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. He's with me all my days, but he's preparing a place to be with me forever. What does it mean to call God your good shepherd? Well, here's a question. What happens when we live all our days with God as our shepherd? Can you do that? I encourage you to read Psalm 23 a bunch of times until it's, it's, it's deep in your heart and your mind. If you haven't memorized it and you want to memorize something in the, in the Bible, that's a good place to start. And just remind yourself, this is my shepherd. This is my God. This is the one who loves me. This is what he promises. This is who he is. This is his character. And how would you pray to the God who is your good shepherd when you pray? Maybe, maybe, and some people just say, oh, dear God, dear God. How about next time you pray, you say this, dear good shepherd. Let's do that in your heart right now. Dear good shepherd. 
Thank you that you are our shepherd all the days of our life until today. And you will be our shepherd all the days of our life until this life ends. And you will be our shepherd for all of eternity. God, we celebrate that you are our good shepherd. We celebrate that you watch over us. You protect us. You discipline us. You pursue us with love and steadfast goodness and kindness. God, you protect us, and Lord, oh, the ways you protect us that we might not even recognize and be aware of. God, you give us confidence in the deep, dark valleys. And so we praise you and we thank you. God, I pray that after this day, we will be reminded of what it means to recognize you as our good shepherd. And Lord, as we come to the table right now, as we partake of the bread, let us remember the price you paid, Jesus. As we partake of the cup, let us remember that like a good shepherd, you fought for our protection at the cost of your own life. Lord, meet us at this table. Remind us of your grace and speak to our hearts. Good shepherd, we are the sheep of your pasture and we meet with you around the table. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you came in tonight, you should have gotten a little communion, uh, the communion elements. And if you're here in the courtyard or in your car, and I'd invite you to get those elements ready. Peel off the little top layer, which is just the wafer, and then the second layer and have the cup ready so you can kind of set those aside and have the wafer in one hand and the cup in the other hand. If you're in the, your cars, you should have gotten those elements too. If you didn't get the elements in your cars, just raise your hand out your window or here in the courtyard, raise your hand, and our teams are ready to bring those to you. We don't want you to miss out. Don't be shy. Just raise your hand and someone will get to you and bring those elements to you at home. If you'd get some crackers and juice, uh, some bread and some wine, whatever you want to use for communion, and get those elements ready so you can partake with us. If you're a visitor with us here in the courtyard, in your car, or online, this is not the table of Shoreline Church, it's the table of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come to the cross and received his grace, and you are walking with Jesus, he is your savior and the leader of your life, this table is for you, so we invite you to partake with us. I would say for children that have not yet made a commitment to Jesus, um, you may feel a little bit left out, and that's okay, but if you're a child that isn't a Christian yet, or if you're an adult that's not yet a Christian, but you're here with us, I'd encourage you to not partake of the elements because you don't really know what it means yet. But if you're, if you're a child, I'd encourage you to ask your parents after the service, what, what does communion mean? And tell me about it. I want to understand this. And, and it may be the time that you could understand the gospel in a way that you could respond to Jesus. So if you're a believer, prepare to partake. If you're not yet a believer, I invite you to refrain, but just to listen to the music and partake by just kind of watching and seeing what's going on around you. And so we're going to, we're going to um, come to the table remembering. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So let me give you three ways to remember Jesus as your good shepherd. Remember the shepherd who came looking for you. There was a day when you didn't know Jesus. There may have been a day when you thought you found Jesus. But I will tell you something long before you thought you found him. He was looking for you. He came for you. He left heaven for you. He took your sins on the cross. And you found him because he let himself be found by pursuing you. Remember him because he came looking for you. Remember Jesus, the shepherd, who protects you at the cost of his own life. The good shepherd has a rod and a staff and he protects his sheep. And Jesus protected you from sin and hell and judgment. On the cross, his body broken, his blood shed to protect you, to take that judgment for you. Remember the shepherd who is here with you now. We celebrated the resurrection just a few days ago. He's risen, he's here, he's present. And there's some moments when he's with you right up close and you can feel him like you can just feel him right next to you. And there's moments sometimes in the dark, tough times where you, you, you have to strain your eyes to see, where, Lord, are you? The psalmist talk about that at times. Lord, where are you? But when you understand that you're a sheep of his pasture and he's your shepherd, even in those moments, if you look, ah, oh, there he is. You know where his eyes are? They're on you. He's watching over you. Remember Jesus as we come to the table. It's so good just to reflect on the good shepherd, just knowing that even in the darkest days of your life, in those darkest valleys, he's with you. In those good moments, he's with you as well. 
And my prayer for us as we open up God's word is just to let these words, his truth, just saturate your heart as we walk in to remember who Jesus is. This is what it says from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As you look at the wafer that you hold in your hand or the bread that you hold in your hand, remember that this bread which we break is our communion with the broken body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, your good shepherd, came for you. He was broken for you. He took the punishment you and I deserved on himself. He was broken to make us whole, and he did it willingly and joyfully. I invite you to remember Jesus Christ, your good shepherd, as we partake of this bread together and remember Jesus Christ. Let's partake of the bread. same way Jesus took the cup he poured into it which would represent the new covenant in his blood that Jesus willingly went to the cross to be the atonement for our sin that all of our guilt all of our shame was paid in full on the cross so as you hold the cup in your hand I just want to encourage you to reflect on his blood that was poured out for you to give you new life in him. Let's partake and drink this in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, it is so good to be in your presence. Yes. And it's so good just to be reminded that you are a good, good shepherd. God, there's no doubt there's people that step foot here tonight that probably feel broken, maybe be in the darkest valleys, God, but I pray that they're refreshed tonight knowing that they have a good shepherd who is not far away, he is near. And as Pastor Kevin said, his eyes are fixed on them. And God, it's so good just to be reminded that you're with us all the days of our lives. So God, I pray for every heart that's here today, God, the people that are watching online, that you would lift up our hearts. God, I pray that it is our goal to live for you all the days of our lives. And in those darkest moments, we just know that you are still there. And we are eternally grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to be the atonement for our sin, who died on a cross. His body was broken for us and his blood was poured out for us so that we can have new life through him. We are eternally grateful for that sacrifice. Pray all this in your name. Amen.